Well, good morning again, church. Hope you're all doing well on this Sunday. Um, I will have to uh, kind of admit something to you guys. I thought you were going to be without your pastor today, and I thought that I might have to bug Ro- Pastor Roger Fall back there last night at 10 o'clock. I ate something last night that gave me an allergic reaction. I didn't know where it came from. My hands were itching. My feet were itching. It was getting like weird to breathe. My heart felt funny. Um, Benadryl came to the cure. The only problem was is it let me sleep too much last night. And so got a little panicky this morning when my alarm didn't go off. Or at least I thought I set the right alarm. But, uh, but anyway, all is good now. And so uh, I just know this. I know there's a restaurant that I will not be going back to and eating there because I don't know what they put on their food that did that to me. And I'm just going to avoid it. I'm going to do what Paul said, to flee that kind of stuff. And so, uh, but today... Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I am glad that I can be here today. Um, This is a message that's going to be fun to talk about, but it's also going to be very challenging because Paul's going to address an issue today that we don't typically deal with in our culture. But all of God's Word is profitable for us. And so we're going to preach it in a way that we understand what Paul might be saying to us today as a church. We are going to start this week our third series of our walk through 1 Corinthians. If you remember when we started, we talked about united and being a united group of believers. No matter what our background is, we are all one in Christ and we need to behave in such a way. Then we moved into the issues on integrity character. We talked about sexual immorality. We talked about marriage. We talked about all these other things in here, lawsuits against believers. We talked about a lot of things that affect who we are in our character and our integrity. And now we're going to get into a section where Paul's going to spend a lot of time talking about our Christian love for God and for our fellow believers. And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I've entitled the message today, Liberty Clarify. Now, I want to give you the definition of liberty. It is the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. Or the second one was, or the power or scope to act as one pleases. Don't we, honestly, as Americans, love liberty? We love the freedom that we have, but you know, there's a warning to be discussed here when we talk about the idea of liberty, because we think things like this, I have the right to do this. Well, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. The Bible doesn't say dot, 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 figure it out, right? We've heard those kinds of things, and so today we're going to look at this idea of liberty. Because the death of Christ has brought us freedom. It has brought us liberty. We know this from Galatians 5.1. It's for freedom that you've been set free. So don't return to the yoke of slavery. And so Paul is pointing out that Christ is going to make us free. And we will be free. But there are some things that we run across as believers that I would put in the gray area. Now, if you have the gift of prophecy like I have, you don't like gray areas. Things are either white or they're either black. But there is no gray area in my mind. And so I struggle with these gray area things. I don't know if any of you are the same way. But some people will will defend it in a gray area. Will say, no, no, no. I'm kind of more Pharisaic in these areas. I tend to say, no, what does the Bible say? And I try to find everything I can to prove my point that the Bible is correct and this is a black and white issue. And this is what it is. And even though it may be a gray, because others may say, well, Christ has set us free. I'm not bound by that any longer. And so therefore I have freedom to do these things. And so does our liberty grant us the grace to do them? How we look at these things really matters. How we define these things really matters. But I think what the real question we ought to ask ourselves is when we're talking about Christian liberty, and we'll see in a moment, is this. How does the decision I make glorify my Father in heaven? I think if we answer it based on that that, that wording, that, that direction of how does it glorify Christ, I think we'll be able to come to the conclusion that there are some decisions that we may be able to make in this gray area 
but still may be the wrong decision to make. And we're going to talk about some of these today, and this is a strange text that we find ourselves in today. Paul is asked a question, what do we do with food that is offered to idols? Can we eat it or not? And so Paul's going to address this. So we're going to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 1. And we're going to see how Paul addresses this issue. And then we're going to look at how what other issues may come out of this in our application today. So stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word if you're capable. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 starting in verse 1 says this. Now concerning food offered to idols. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. If anyone imagines what he, that he knows something, he does not know yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be, so, may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all are all things and from whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through him we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you today. Thankful that we can all be here gathered around this text, around your word, God, to discuss this issue that the Corinthians asked you, whether or not meat can be eaten that was sacrificed to idols. But God, we know that this is not an issue in which we often deal with in our culture today. But God, there's some principles here, some principles of love, some principles of actions, and some principles of behavior that we as believers need to be able to identify in our life so that the end of the day, our decisions are made that bring you the most glory, not our liberty. And so God, speak to us now as we study your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to break this thing down into two points. I know you guys are used to my three points, but I've only got two points for you today. And so here we go. The first one is this that I think Paul is addressing here when he's addressing this issue about food being offered to idols. The first thing he does is he kind of points out a love for God. That, that to in answer this question, we must identify who Jesus is and we must have a love for him. He is continuing here to answer their questions from that letter we know that they wrote him. Now we, again, do not have that letter. We're only able to go off of what Paul says, that he's answering a question to that letter. And so they asked him about this idea of eating food that has been offered to idols. This was an issue in Corinth. In Corinth, the city was made up of pagan temples, as we've talked about, and there were many pagan gods that were being worshipped, and they would come together often, and they would sacrifice animals into these pagan temples, and they would therefore then have a feast, and then people would be invited to eat of these feasts. And so there was this idea of all of this meat being uh, sacrificed and killed and then put on for celebrations, festivals, and service in this pagan culture. And here's, here's what would happen. They would take the animal. I want you to think of your favorite food that's meat-based. Uh, mine is a cow. Okay. They would bring this cow into this temple. They would then kill this animal. They would then clean this animal. And they would take all of the unwanted parts. So the stomach those kinds of things, the skin, the hide, all the things that people weren't going to eat. And that's what they would burn on the altar. And then after that was done, they would take the rest of the meat and then they would cook it 
for consumption at their festival or at their celebration. And people would gather after the sacrifice was made and then they would eat. And then if there was any leftover meat or if they had too much, they would then sell it in the marketplace. And so when believers would come, they would see these things. They would be invited to these temples. They could just walk in and, and have dinner or lunch with them. A lot, of the, a lot of people believed that these temples had restaurants on the side of them. So it would be like you and I just going to a restaurant to eat that's attached to a, to a temple where this animal was just sacrificed. But then also, most people would go to the marketplace to buy their meat. And so was it okay then to buy this meat and then consume this meat? This is what's going on in Corinth at the time. Nothing, when they sacrificed an animal, went to waste. And so Paul's going to ask the question, can believers partake of this meat? Well, you know that one of the things we know about the Greeks is they were smart people. They liked to study things. They liked to, to know things. And they wanted to be smarter than their brothers. Remember, we talked about lawsuits among believers and how this was like a game to them, was to know more and more and more so they could defeat their brothers in court of law. Th these guys love knowledge. And Paul points it out here. All of us possess knowledge, but this knowledge puffs up. What is Paul saying here? To, to these more mature believers, these guys that have in Corinth that have understood what Christ did for them, understood the freedom that he gave, that he's made all things now clean, and that they can consume this, this meat and stuff, their knowledge is telling them that I have the right to eat of this meat because this is sacrificed to an idol that doesn't really exist. And so therefore, I'm just eating a steak. And they're saying, can we do this? Is it okay for us? To eat of this, it has no impact on people. This idol is false. So Paul kind of confirms it. Hey, you have this knowledge. You do have this understanding that this, there is no God but one God. There is only one God in which we should come to in worship. And so he's kind of confirming that they have this knowledge, that they are correct. That this is just, in reality, just a cooked cow. that they, should, they, in theory, should be able to eat of this. What is he saying? That, look at the text. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom you are, are all things and from whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, to whom are all things and through whom we exist. Paul is pointing out, we, we do believe there is one God. God. John 1, chapter 1 through 4, we studied this in our study on John a while back. Uh, but I'm going to take you back to it. John 1, 1 through 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life that was the light of men. So Paul is telling them, yes, there is only one true God, and this is not Him. This is not who they are sacrificing to. And so therefore, they, all they did was barbecue a good cow. He, he's making it clear, yeah, there, but we, we come and worship one true God. But you have to keep in mind, he's dealing with a, some Jewish context as well here. And so one of the things that I believe Paul is doing here is he's revealing to us the Trinity monotheistic religion one god in three persons he's starting to reveal this here because he talks about god then he talks about jesus and so he is making a reference to deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 5 this would be one of the this would be like the john 3:16 of the old testament Moses giving direction to the people before they enter into the wilderness. He says this about Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. To the Jewish believers, this was essential to their faith. One God. And they're to love him with all that they have. Matter of fact, the Jews would go and pray this prayer multiple times a day as a reminder to them that there was only one God in which who they serve. One Lord, one Savior, one God. But then he talks about Jesus, and so we have to identify this Jesus, and I think it's important. And when we start talking about Jesus and the Father, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we start talking about the Trinity and all these kinds of things, here is some texts that I believe help us understand this monotheistic view we have of what we believe. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Here we see it, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, Jesus, one equal with God. And Paul's trying to make it clear here that there is but one God, and Jesus is also this one God, monotheistic. He is the God who became flesh and dwelt among us. But I think we need to understand something about Jesus. He didn't come to just hang out with us. <laughs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? It'd be nice if you were just sitting there and all of a sudden, boom, there he pops up right beside you. Oh, hey, Jesus, how are you today? Like, wouldn't it be cool to just have the Jesus in the flesh right beside you? Now, before you answer that question, you ought to think about it. <laughs> You've got to take him everywhere you go. You'll see everything you do, which we know by the third person of the Trinity that already happens. It's a whole lot easier to run from something you don't see. <laughs> but he is God. And as Paul points out that the, that the Jewish people, there is but one God, and we're to love him. Jesus is the same God that we talked about this undivided devotion last time. That we, we should be devoted to God. We should be devoted to Jesus. Right? He is the one that came and paid a price that we couldn't pay. We call this substitutionary atonement on a cross. That he died for you and for me. For sins that we created that we could never pay for. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Aren't you glad he didn't make you try to clean your act, your act up first? Aren't you glad he didn't try to make you perfect first? I'm glad he says, come as you are, and then we can be made clean. So we should love him first with all that we have. What does this look like for you? What does loving God look like for you? Hey, here's a question for you. Do you thank him for your salvation often, or do you take it for granted? That's a deep question, isn't it? You know how we reflect that and how we know that in our prayer life? Do we thank him? Do we personally say, thank you, Jesus, for my salvation, for your son, for paying a price I could never pay? Do you tell him that you love him? That's an awkward question, maybe your comment, too. But do I tell him that I love him? Do I devote my day to him? Do you, when you get up in the morning, do you say, Dear Lord, thank you for your salvation. You know, I love you in a way that I could never truly live out. And I want to devote this day to you. So help me to walk in such a way that this day is devoted to you. You have to ask yourself this question. Is he the reason for everything? Is he the reason for your existence? Is he the reason why you are where you are and you have what you have? Listen, our daily lives should reflect the joy in which he gives us. You know what the sad part about it is? We as Christians a lot of times running around like Eeyore. Oh, poor pitiful me. When it's for joy, it's for freedom, it's for liberty in which Christ died for us. And yet we sometimes do not run around thanking him for the salvation, telling him we love him, devoting our day to him, understanding he's the reason that we have anything. And I think Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians in chapter 3, tells us about an attitude that we need to have as we express our love towards God. Listen to it in Philippians 3, starting in verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. 
Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now listen to what he says. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by all any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Can you sum your life up like Paul did? Paul had every right to claim his Jewish heritage, what he had attained in life. And he said, but I count it all as loss for the sake of Christ. Rubbish. I can do nothing. But he did it for me. Can we say the same? Can you ask the question, what would you have if Christ didn't have you? When we began to live, church, in a sacrificial life that puts our love for God first, it is then and only then that we can begin to handle all of the darts that the enemy wants to throw at us. It's only then that we put ourselves in the protection of he who died for us and who has something better for us. Because listen, when those fiery darts start coming at us, we can say, just like Jesus did in the desert when he was being tempted, depart from me, Satan. Because we love God, we know there's a bigger plan, there's a bigger truth, and we know that this too shall pass. And one day I will be with him in all of glory as he designed us to be. You do realize that God didn't create us so he could die for us. You do understand that's not the principle of Christianity, right? Jesus did not die for us as the reason for Christianity. God created us for his glory. That is the purpose of why God created us. Not so that he would have to come and die. That's a result of what happened because man sinned. He came and he died for us. But the reason that God created us was for his glory. And there's only one way to give him that glory, and that is to love him as he is the one who desires that, who is the one who did all of that for us. And so he's saying, there is but one God. Jesus is this God. So what does this question mean to us? What does this question right here to you and I matter today if whether or not we can eat of this meat offered to idols or not can we eat it i mean jesus gave us freedom right and made all things clean sure he's saying yeah you can go have that t-bone can can we eat it i mean should a should a christian be able to eat that t-bone i don't know about you but um somebody says they're cooking t-bones and invites me over i'm probably not missing that meal oh and by the way probably at a cheap price that's even better isn't it Paul's going to address it. What's the big deal? But he didn't say yes right here, did he? He points out that their focus needs to be on Christ and Christ alone, their love for God. But here's what he's going to do in the last half of this text. And I want you to see the truth of this. This is where I think it gets real for us. This is where I think things are going to hit the road hard. This is where as your pastor, I I wish sometimes I didn't have a text like this to preach. But for some reason, it seems like all through Corinthians, this text that I really wish I didn't have to preach. But he's going to answer it. And there are things in our lives that are being sacrificed to idols that we can or cannot do. And we need to know how to deal with those things. And so here is the answer to the question that I think Paul's going to point out. The second point, the last part of this from 7 through 13, is the love for family. 
And when I'm talking about family here, I'm talking about the Christian family, your brothers and your sisters in Christ. We need to have a love for them. He tells them that knowledge is good. It's good to know these things. Remember what he also said, knowledge puffs up. And so I, th- I think that what Paul's not saying is, Paul isn't saying don't come to life group. Paul's not saying don't be involved in a D group. Paul's not saying don't read your Bible. Paul's not saying don't pray. Paul's saying that we should pursue knowledge. We should pursue understanding who God is. But the result of that pursuit should not lead us into conceit, but should lead us into sacrificial living. To love our family. Love is the answer. First for God, and then second for family. You notice he says in the great commandment, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Right? And that's why he says it first, because he says, and next, the next one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Everything hinges on these two commands. Love God and love others. We have been commanded by God to love our brothers and our sisters. It is in love, not legalism, that we help our brothers and sisters who may be new in the faith grow in their knowledge, their discipleship, and in their service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We were all there at one point in time. There are those around us and amongst us who don't have the same knowledge that we do. They may have started walking this Christian walk a lot later in life than we did. They may be young people that converted, and we may have been around a lot longer. But we are to walk in love because it is love that encourages, that edifies, that equips those younger believers. And for those of us in the room that may take our study of God's word serious and may know more than others know, we need to be careful that in our understanding of who God is and what he's done, that our knowledge can be a stumbling block to somebody else. We can hurt others with our knowledge. But if we check it at the door and we live in love, we can help our younger brothers and sisters walk in a way that they don't sin. We should teach them what true liberty is, what freedom is. Romans 12, verse 9 says, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. Catch this. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. What is he saying here? Let your love be genuine. And if our love is genuine, it is displayed in a life that is selfless. Not selfish. So, we need to be careful church believers when we make statements like well i have the right to do this i have freedom in this they're the ones that need to get on board christ has done this for us why why are they arguing against us why are they struggling against us why are they even asking this question we should be able to eat this t-bone and they should know that so they just need to come join us Here's what I want to tell you. There are brothers and sisters that are walking with some very real issues in their life that they have, just like many of these young believers, have come out of probably these pagan lifestyles, and they are walking away from this type of rituals, and and they don't need the encouragement to go back. And so there's this liberty that they need to understand what it is, but this liberty may be the freedom, but they're also, as a believer and loving for God, they need to pull that liberty back in. They need to pull that freedom back in a little bit. They need to set it aside for the sake of their brothers and sisters. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, another favorite text of mine, one of the many, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Catch this, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul recognized something, that he was a prisoner of the Lord, and that by being a prisoner of the Lord, he had a responsibility to obey the one that he was imprisoned to. And so he was to walk in humility, gentleness. He says, walk in patience, bearing with one another in love, maintain the unity of the Spirit. This should be our aim. Can I ask you a question? Is it worth winning the argument all the time? Whether you can eat a T-bone or not? Do we just want to win the argument sometimes? Or, or are we ready to set that aside so that we can see to the spiritual maturity of our brother and sister? Raising them up in the ways of the Lord. Teaching them the things of God. I would tell you that I think Paul is saying here that we need to check our attitudes at the door sometimes. We need to examine our hearts and understand what it is that we are fighting for because here is the truth. The world is Satan's and the world attacks us and there is evil that is always wanting to destroy us. The devil wants us as believers to fall. And so we need to put on these things. We need to put on love, live in love. And give up those things that cause you and others to stumble. Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of the reverence for Christ. Paul's making it clear here that, hey, there are some gray areas in which we will find ourselves as believers, and we need to be ready and willing to do what it takes to answer the question the right way. Because the the older believers, the ones that were more solid in their understanding of who God was, they were taking their liberty and they were just basically saying, it doesn't matter. And I just think that any time we do something that causes somebody that's weaker than us to stumble, it does matter. I can think of many, many things that cause younger believers to stumble and we as more, more mature believers are the reason why they're stumbling. It was creating a trap for them. Do you see what it looked like, what it looks like to a young believer? I want you to get this image. See what it looks like to a young believer. They've given their life to Christ. They've walked away from things that were sinful or the things that were separating them from God. And they're they're trying to, to become like God, to become holy as He is holy is what He told us to do. And then all of a sudden, there's a believer who's doing something that looks, in the freedom that they've been given, very much like the world lives. So the pagans are doing it, and the mature believers are doing it. What is the new Christian to do? Well, and if you're like me, when you've come out of things that you shouldn't be doing, and if your older, more mature believers are still doing it, then it makes it look like, well, you really didn't have to leave that to begin with, and so therefore must not be sin, so therefore you can partake in it, and therefore find yourself stumbling again in a way that is sinful. What do we care most about as believers? Do we want our fellow brothers and sisters walking down that kind of road, asking those kind of questions? Finding themselves stumbling and in sin all the time? Or do we want to be the ones that that, that lift them up and encourage them and edify them and teach them the ways of the Lord? I mean, to these guys, they're saying it's just a good T-bone. What do they really matter? But these young believers, it was more than a T-bone. It was sacrificed to an idol. So to them, it would cause them to stumble. They might enter back into evil practices and wrong practices, and therefore, it was a sin then for them to eat that meat. Because it was leading them somewhere they shouldn't have gone. But was it overall, in God's eyes, a sin to eat that meat? No. It was just to an idol. Just Like I said before, it's a T-bone. But to these new believers, it was a big deal. So here's what I would ask you then, who are living in liberty and living in freedom.
is it a sin to cause our fellow brothers to fall away? I, I think James chapter 4, some of you in here, I know this is your favorite verse. But I think James gives us an answer, and then Paul in Romans does. James 4, 17 says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. We, we even see it in the text today. Um, and so by your knowledge, in verse 11, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. I would tell you that, yes, when we as stronger believers have freedom and liberty to do things, but we do them in such a way that allows our weaker brothers and sisters to stumble, therefore causing them to sin, we have brought sin upon ourselves. It is a stumbling block, and we need to be extra cautious when we live our lives in such a way where we just basically say things. Well, Christ, Christ doesn't care about this. This is a gray area. It doesn't really matter. I can do it. I have the right to do it. I live in a country that says I have the right to do it. Stumbling blocks are never good. Especially when we lay them in front of believers. I <laughs> just think about that for a moment. Do you realize we do that sometimes walking in our Christian walk? We take stumbling blocks. We take uh, road barriers or whatever you want to call them. We put parking curbs. And as we walk along, do you realize sometimes we just drop those behind us so that those that are watching us and follow us trip over those same things? We don't because we're free of them. But we're laying them there for other people to come behind us and to trip over. Paul in Romans 14 says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to put a stumbling block, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable in God approved by men. To God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upholding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourselves and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith. For whatever he does not proceed from faith is sin. So we have to ask some real serious questions when we study a text like this. Are there things in our life that we have freedom to do so, but yet we are leaving roadblocks behind us as we go. Are there things like that that we need to deal with? I understand this, though. It is hard to quit some of the things that we're doing that we may be convicted about and may be causing others to stumble. It is extremely difficult to quit some of these things. Some things are easy to quit, aren't they? There are some things in your life like, oh, I can give that up, no big deal. But there is something in our life that is causing our brothers to stumble. And it is for freedom that we justify it. I want to talk about some of these things. What are some big issues? That not food sacrifice to idols can we consume. But what about in our culture today? What are some of these big issues? Is there a food? Can we eat pork or not eat pork? That may be a legitimate question. I had a guy I was working for one time. Uh, with actually he was a, a truck driver in a company that I ran and he said uh, we were going across the street to Bono's to eat and I said hey you want to go to eat with us he said no I said why he said they sell pig there I was like yeah man they 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 smoke Boston butts and ribs and stuff he said I don't eat I don't eat pork and I said is this a religious thing <laughs> he said no I'm from Bosnia I said what does that mean he said pigs eat people what are you talking about and if you know anything about what's going on in Bosnia in the past, Mr. Price and I talk about this a lot. The army can just come in and shoot you and drag your body out in the road and just leave you there. And you know how they dispose of it? They let the wild pigs and the pigs in the street eat the bodies. So he wasn't going to eat pork. But what is it that causes us to stumble? Is it food? How about this one? I'm going to get on a soapbox for a minute. Drinking alcohol. I'm here to tell you that I honestly believe that the Bible speaks of abstinence of alcohol. I know we're in a Baptist church, and that's part of our statement of faith that we don't consume alcohol, but I also know that this is an issue that many people deal with. But I'm here to tell you this is something that needs to be addressed. I think it's clearly addressed in Scripture. 
Wine is a mocker and beer is a brawler. Those who are led astray are not wise. Avoid strong drink, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That strong drink right there is enough for me to say that it's wrong. But here's another reason. Because alcohol causes our brothers to stumble. We ought to quit it. Smoking. Dipping. Chewing. How about movies you watch? How about the language that you use? I mean, do you want me to keep going down this list? We could go on forever about things that we think we have the freedom and the liberty to do because God has paid those prices for us. He has made a lot of things clean. He's put a lot of things in a gray area, and Christ doesn't care about those things. But if it causes our brothers or sisters to stumble, he cares. Now, I want to get into another area of this gray area. What about church? How's our commitment to church? Do we just go when we want to go? Do we come when we want to come? Are we late every week? Commitment. Attendance or involved. Do we just come to church on Sunday and we go home? Are we involved in a life group? Are we involved in a D group? Are we doing things that help make us more like Christ, that help us get rid of stumbling blocks in our lives? I'm here to tell you, if you're not growing in some kind of knowledge of the Lord, you won't be able to get rid of these stumbling blocks. Here's a big one, and I'm not going to harp on this because it's coming towards the end of Corinthians. There is a message coming, and I'm not going to tell you which one because you'll all skip out on this one. But how about tithing? How about supporting the work that God's called us to do here? 80% of the budget here is covered by about 20% of the people. Could you imagine if we all got serious to the Lord and gave just what we're supposed to give, what he commands us to give? And by the way, I think the New Testament teaches of a higher percentage than 10% because he says give cheerfully. And that word in the Greek means hilarious. And everything that the Lord did in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount, he elevated above law. What if we tithe the way he wanted us to tithe? Some will argue this is between them and God. You're right. But it could also be a stumbling block to other believers who want to support the work of the ministry. So you may have freedoms in some areas, but church people are watching. And the ones that we need to be concerned about too, especially not just the lost, but we need to be concerned about those who are not as deep in our faith as we are. We're to be in the world, but not part of it. We're to be different. So I want you to think about this real scenario that I think is going to happen one day. When it comes to loving God and loving family and us living in our liberty, here's what I want to ask you. When you stand before Jesus, do you really want to defend your liberty? Do you really want to defend the reason why you did certain things and caused other people to stumble? Do you want to defend your actions? Just because you had the right to do so? I can think of scriptures in the Bible that says it's better for a man to have a millstone tied around his neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Whew. I don't want to stand before Jesus and him say, why did you cause those to stumble? Just because I felt like I had a right to do so? Next week, we're going to talk about Paul and the example that he sets in this text when he's addressing this issue. He's going to go on and give them a little bit more of an example of how to live. This is what I want us to walk away with today. Church, we are free in Christ. It is for freedom that we have been set free. We're not to return to the bondage and the yoke of slavery. It is freedom that we've been set free. But I want you to understand this. That freedom was very costly. That freedom cost God everything. Not for us to go squander it, just, just throw it aside and not care. So we need to be sensitive. We need to love God in a way that will allow us to love as he loved. Do I don't ever see Jesus in the New Testament setting his rights over his love for people. He was sacrificial. He was loving. He was caring. He invited people to come know him to surrender to him, to love him, to follow him. Not to accept him and then return to their old way of life. So I think that's the same for us. That is the example that you and I need to understand is this freedom was very, very costly. And while we might have liberty, 
we need to know that sometimes we need to rein in that liberty. And we need to walk as Christ walked. To surrender to the will of God, which would cause us to strive to live a life that points the lost to Christ and new believers to being fully devoted followers of His. Where they too can battle the same temptations you and I battle. There was a time in my life as a pastor where I had a major temptation. Many of you have said stuff to me. You've seen it on Facebook. Any, any of you ever get to share Jesus this week? Show of hands. Anybody get to share Jesus this week? Well, your pastor did. Yesterday on the side of 301 to a homeless guy walking up the road. Saw my truck broke down. Came over and asked me if he could help me. I told him, no, I had it covered. I already had the alternator off on the side. Let me tell you, that's dangerous to change an alternator on the side of 301. Had it off, waiting on dad to get there with it, and the guy walked over and said, you need help? I said, no, sir, I don't need any help. And I said, what are you doing walking? He said, I'm heading to get back to Alabama to a rehab. I said, really, what are you rehab for? He said, methamphetamines and heroin. So if I go there and I, and I complete it for a year, I get, they'll give me a truck, and I can come back down here to the guy that's promised me a job, and I want to get my life straight. I said, why do you want to get your life straight? He said, because my mom and dad deserve me to get my life straight. It's a good reason. I said, can I also tell you something, sir? He said, what? I said, about 25-year-old. He said, I said, you know, you have a... You have another family member that wants to see you get your life straight? He said, I do. I said, yeah. Your father in heaven wants you to get your life straight. I said, Jesus came and died so that you can have freedom from these bad, evil things that are controlling you right now. I said, man, in in Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. He goes on in 10, 13, it says, all those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I said, that's all you got to do, brother. I said, that's the first step you need to take along your journey the rest of the way to Alabama is surrender your life to Jesus, and I promise you, he will help you get through this. And I said, you know, I never had a drug problem. I I never got addicted to anything like that. I don't like drugs, by the way. I don't like pharmaceutical drugs, so I can't imagine taking street drugs. But I said, brother, there was a time in my life, though, where something had me. It was alcohol. I said, well, God took it away. And I no longer struggle with it. I no longer have a desire to do it. And it wasn't long before he started making his way from me. (laughs) But listen, I won. He heard the gospel. Now guess what? He's got to think about it all the way in that long walk. And I'm praying that the Lord will consistently put people in his path where he will be able to surrender his life to God and beat those demons in which he faces every day. Church, we need to love God. We need to love others. We need to set our liberty aside sometimes and our freedoms aside sometimes and just begin to live as Christ lived. One day you're going to experience true, true freedom, true liberty in the presence of God in heaven where the place will be perfect. But for today, we will all battle an evil world. We will all battle sin that tries to attack us. We will all battle things that try to entangle us and bring us down. And I would rather walk alongside Christians who are fighting the good fight of the faith so that many more may come to know the same God that we serve. I do not want to be a stumbling block. Church, I hope that you do not want to be a stumbling block, not only to the new believers in this area, but to those in this community who are lost. We look no different when we act like them. And I'm telling you what the world needs to see is love for Christ lived out among his people. Quit justifying things. Quit making excuses for it. What would Jesus do? And so here as the band comes back up, I know I was on a, it seemed like I was on a soapbox a little bit there. But Paul was. And Paul was teaching them something very significant to them. Can I eat this meat? That was sacrificed to idols. I think there's a question that we all need to ask of ourselves. What is it that I think in my Christian liberty and Christian freedom that I have to do that may be a stumbling block to others? Can I drink this beer? Can I drink this glass of wine? Can I speak like this? Can I watch this movie? Can I go to these kinds of places? I don't know. You're going to have to define that. You're going to have to defend that, if you will. But here's what I want to ask you to do today. This, this, this invitation today is different. 
Yes, I will be down here if you want to give your life to Christ. If the Lord's speaking to you and you're saying, hey, I don't have that freedom at all. I'm in bondage to sin and I need Jesus. I I just quoted the Romans 10. I will share that with you and I will help you understand that. I will help you understand what it means to dedicate and to give your life to Jesus. We will take information. We will follow up with you. Some of you may want to come and say, hey, I need to be baptized, Pastor. Some of you may come like I got today and say, hey, I want to be a member of your church of God's church here at Northside. Yeah, I will be down here to receive you for all of those things, but there is an invitation today that I think when we preach on a text like this, we need to be ready to respond to the Holy Spirit. And we don't need to worry about what people think, what people say, what people do. Our responsibility today on a message like this is to respond to the Lord Jesus. And so each and every one of us, I know I had to think through this as I prepared this message this week, had to start thinking about what stumbling blocks am I leaving behind me that I need to remove and begin to pray about those things. But there are some of you today that are saying, you know what, Pastor, you're right. God's word is true. And there are some things in here that I'm doing. I I am eating some meat sacrificed to idols at the expense of my fellow brothers. I'm doing this or I'm doing that. I don't want to know what those are. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to know those. Unless you need me for accountability purposes to hold you accountable to that, I don't need to know those things. But I believe this invitation today is a big one. What are we doing to make people holy, to help them pursue holiness? Or are we creating stumbling blocks? What is it in your life that you need to give up, that are causing others to stumble? I'm going to tell you where I believe the first place to start is. It's right here on these altars on your knees. It's not worry about what everybody else is saying or doing. Just come, kneel, pray that the Lord will open your eyes and he gives you a way out as you surrender your freedom to him. That is when we will experience joy. That is when we will experience all of who God is. And I don't know about you, but I want to grow. I want to experience him more. Do you? Well, what is it that's stopping you? So I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, it is my prayer that if you've identified it, or maybe you haven't, but you know there's something there, I'm going to ask you to come and pray. You don't have to tell anybody why you're here. But if you mean it, you'll come up here. Some of you, this will be the hardest walk you ever make. But I promise you, it will be the most rewarding walk you ever make. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you humbly, bowed, heads, eyes closed. After hearing a message like this, what appears to be an easy text for us, God, of can we eat meat? Can we have the T-bone that's been sacrificed to an idol? And God, we know that you've said you have made all things clean. So why make something unclean that is clean? They said there are gray areas in our lives that we, we live in, God, and we believe we have the Christian liberty or freedom to do those things. But I think, God, when we get to the root of your word and what Paul was teaching us here through his instruction and his wisdom and as an apostle, he was teaching us here in Corinthians, God, that we have liberty. We have freedom in you. But, God, we need to clarify that in our lives. We need to rein in some of our freedoms at times for the sake of our brothers and sisters and so God I pray that for any that are here that are battling some of these things I I pray God they will come and bend the knee here at this altar coming to you seeking your guidance your wisdom your help your mercy your grace to to stop doing whatever it is that, that could be causing others to stumble God I know in our hearts we all want to be found pleasing to you We all want you to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We all want to love you. We all want to honor you. But God, some of the things that are required of us or asked of us just seem really hard to do sometimes. It's not easy. But God, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts. That the altars will be full of people that are coming to seek your face in these matters. And so God, I pray that over these next few minutes, you will have your... Your will will be done in the lives of your 
church members here, God, so that we can be a church that's more united than ever, that has high Christian integrity and high Christian character, God, that is beginning to live a life of love. Our mission statement here that you gave us, to love God, love church, and to love others. God, I pray this will become our identity as believers, not causing others to stumble, but those to come to everlasting life to raise up others to follow you in the same way. So God, over these next few moments, I pray that you have your way. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.